record on this computer. All right, uh, good, I'm, I'm recording this. Uh, the title of this talk is Undergraduate Research at uh, PGCC. When does 100 milliliters plus 100 milliliters not equal 200 milliliters? An application of London dispersion forces, which is a general chemistry topic that uh, we have recently talked about in our classes. And I've got a little picture here, and the picture shows uh, my ethanol and my water, uh, which are each 100 milliliters. And when you add them together, you get 196 milliliters, not 200, and not a, a whole lot different, but from a chemistry perspective, it's definitely interesting. And then I've got my bottle of hand sanitizer here because uh, ethanol and water, alcohol and water is, is the basic recipe for hand sanitizer. And hand sanitizer is uh, a topic that <laughs> during the pandemic has been very interesting. Uh, and very needed, very, very useful topic. Now that's the topic for today's talk. Um, oh, let me see if that will, uh, there we go. And the topic, uh, the talk that I would give in a more scientific vein would be estimating the partial molar volume of each component in a binary solution using refractive index measurements. So that's when I, when I talk, that's actually the title of the talk I'll give at the American Chemical Society meeting this spring. Now, uh, I wanna start by just reviewing the equipment we need to do this research. Uh, my research and the research in my group is always very simple and straightforward. I like to keep it that way. We use a jeweler's scale, a uh, plastic labware kit, and a handheld refractometer. So nothing fancy here. Uh, in fact, um, this work uh, is, uh, uses a kit basically that we use for the Gen Chem classes and, um, and for the Chem 2000 classes here. Um, and uh, in fact, some of that research is being done at home uh, this semester as well. Uh, we're piloting that too. That's another talk, um, but basic stuff. We use this um, uh, in the lab. Uh, and who is doing research this semester? Well, some of you are here, uh, Laura, Autumn, Tondarai, Anthony, and Kate uh, are the researchers that we've got this semester. And you can see them down here at the bottom uh, working on the, uh, at the hoods in Chesapeake 320. Uh, and that's because we are using some volatile chemicals this semester. Uh, previous semester, this uh, research was done at home using kits. So, um, this is again low budget, but uh, and great experience for how to do research. What does our research data look like? Well, it's again it's pretty straightforward. We've got um, the mass of the beaker. We're using our scale. We've got the mass of water and the mass of water plus two propanol here, and then we use the handheld refractometer to measure something called percent bricks and. I'm not going to talk too much about percent bricks, but we do turn that into refractive index. And if there's a question, I can answer it um, later too. And uh, what type of data do we collect? Well, this is actual data that we have collected. We collect data for refractive index of binary solutions, binary meaning two component, and our two components are two propanol, which is also called isopropanol, and water. And this is Autumn's data, uh, actually. Uh, you can see she took about uh, 20 points at a range of mole fractions between zero and one. And um, what's interesting about this, one of the many things is that uh, if you plot a straight line between the uh, down here at zero, this is gonna be pure water. And up here at one mole fraction, which is pure two propanol, that the data do not follow the straight line. And that's what's called a non-ideal solution. So non-ideal solutions have physical properties that are not straight lines between the two endpoints. And many solutions are ideal. This is a solution that is not. And that's one of the reasons we're interested in it. So that's, and this is not new. People have seen this before. And one of the things I wanna emphasize about our research is that a lot of it is based on stuff that's been done before. We're just taking the next step and we'll talk about what those next steps are eventually. Um, okay, and uh, 
But before we go on and talk about our actual data in more depth, let's talk about what is a refractive index. And then we're gonna talk about how we actually turn it into uh, this thing called a partial molar volume. But we need to understand what, what these topics are first. And so what is the refractive index? Well, some of you may know this. It is the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in a material. And I've got the equation right here. And the value for water is 1.3332, meaning that in water, light goes more slowly than in a vacuum. And that leads to this picture here, which is a spoon. And when that light slows down, it uh, the, makes the spoon appear to bend uh, when we look at it with our eye. And then why does light slow down? Uh, it's because light is interacting with the electrons circling the nuclei of atoms. That is literally what slows the light down, okay? So when we talk about a refractive index, we are talking about a way of measuring that we're relating to the speed of light in a material compared to in a vacuum. Well, uh, for example, we, there, this, you can do this for many things. You can take the uh, refractive index for different plastics. And you can see as light goes through a piece of plastic, the light bends because of this angle change. And there's a whole physics topic about uh, what's called Snell's law and the law of refraction. And um, which again, we won't go into detail about, but light bends when it goes to different materials because the speed of light is different. And this leads to an interesting application uh, uh, about how to make things invisible. So you match the refractive index of a solid to a solution. And here on the left, I've got water. And what you're gonna see in a minute is a video of me putting a glass stir rod into it. And for water, the refractive indices of the water and the stir rod will be different. For uh, corn oil, we match the refractive end index of the corn oil to be exactly the refractive index of the stir rod. So let's see if I can play this now. And you really can't see it, which uh, is turning things invisible, which is pretty awesome. So um, anyway, I just wanted to show that uh, how to, you know, I'm not sure how this relates to um, making planes invisible in the sky and things like that. But anyway, just a useful touch point. All right, so that's a little bit about refractive index. Now let's talk about this concept of a molar volume. In general chemistry, we're perhaps much more interested in the molar mass, and we use it a lot. And the molar mass is just the mass of a mole. And a mole is a particular set of atoms called Avogadro's number of atoms. And so um, what I've got here is for water, if you want to calculate the molar volume, V sub m, it's molar mass over density. You can show that the gram units cancel out milliliters kicks up to the top, and it's actually milliliters per mole right here. And we can do the same thing for ethanol. And the fact that ethanol has a larger molar volume is because in general, it's a larger molecule. It's got more atoms to it. Okay. So that's what the molar volume is. Now let's talk about the partial molar volume. And the partial molar volume is the molar volume of a substance when it is mixed with another substance. Um, and for example, if we have a pool of ethanol here in green and we add uh, a mole of water to it, the water actually takes only 14.0 milliliters per mole, a 20% smaller volume than the 18.07 if it was pure water. And uh, just a, if for those in uh, general chemistry uh, or who remember their general chemistry, we also talked about something called partial pressure. And so it's sort of a similar idea. Partial pressure is for gases. Partial molar volume would be for liquids. 
mixing together. And this leads to the bartender's conundrum, which is uh, a uh, scientific idea that when a bartender makes a margarita or, um, or uh, any alcoholic drink and mixes tequila with um, simple syrup and lime juice, the margarita isn't 200 milliliters, it's actually less. And um, this is one of my favorite ways, especially on a Friday afternoon to think about science is while contemplating the bartender's conundrum. Um, so there's your reference to margaritas. Another scientifically though, that we wanna ask the question, why is the partial molar volume smaller? And the short answer is, actually nobody really knows, which is always interesting about science. If we then go for a longer answer, uh, it's, it's a difficult question, but people uh, hypothesize that the water disrupts the local structure of the ethanol molecules and in a way that the water molecules can sort of hide. But that's a pretty hand-waving sort of uh, idea that, um, you know, how, <laughs> what does that even mean? And uh, the longest answer that people are starting to do is they're starting to do computer simulations. And this reference down at the bottom is one such computer simulation. And you can use computers and uh, quantum mechanics to model what happens when you put a bunch of water molecules in a bunch of ethanol molecules and actually see, do they hide? What does that hiding look like? What is the structure? And some initial steps have been made, but um, I think really we go back to the short answer. Nobody really knows. And that's, that's where the science comes in. That's, you know, uh, in a, yet another way. Now the effects are small, right? 200 milliliters becomes 196. So why do we care? This is always a good question to ask. And uh, two reasons I'll, I'll suggest. One is, the effects are small but measurable. And if you're bottling hand sanitizer and you put in uh, you know, whatever percentages you need to make this with the active ingredients here, and you can see uh, what is hand sanitizer, but it's 70% uh, by volume ethyl alcohol, which is ethanol with a couple other, with some other things going in there, including water. So it's basically an ethanol water solution. You wanna make sure you get eight fluid ounces and not 7.9. And so if you're making thousands of bottles of this, you better take that into account when you decide how you're gonna make it. And then the more uh, academic reason is, well, partial molar volume is the easiest partial molar quantity to measure, but partial molar free energy is important in determining when a reaction is at equilibrium. And uh, what I like to say is nature is lazy. Nature always goes to the lowest energy state. And you can see that in physics, when a ball rolls down a hill, that is lowering the potential energy of the ball. In Gen Chem 1, we have what's called a reaction energy diagram, where potential energy of your reactants and products is plotted. And for exothermic reactions, the reactants lower their potential energy to become products. And that's typically how reactions occur, though not always. Um, uh, and that's because it's lowering the potential energy. And in Gen Chem 2 and beyond, you get into molar free energy and the partial molar free energy because nature is lazy and the lowest energy state it goes to in chemistry and in general is the lowest molar free energy state. And you can see that right here. And another way of saying that it's going to the lowest molar free energy state is to say that the partial molar free energy of the reactants and the products are equal at this minimum. So uh, a lot of people are interested in this and you can do a lot more with partial molar volume and partial molar free energy as well. But I wanted to at least talk about why this is of scientific interest as uh, in addition to the industrial interest of making hand sanitizer. Now, um, we measure refractive indices. How do we turn these into partial molar volumes? We'd use something called the molar refraction. So that's the next concept we have to talk about. But molar refraction is a measure of the total polarizability. 
And total, total polarizability is another topic we relate to general chemistry because polarizability or total polarizability relates to London dispersion forces. And in my class, we picture London dispersion forces in the following way. Take two helium atoms and the electrons are sloshing around and circling the nucleus at any one particular instant. The electrons are on a little imbalanced, which creates an instantaneous dipole that induces a dipole on the neighboring atom. And the interaction between these two atoms is called the London dispersion force. And this for helium atoms, all atoms in all molecules have these. If we then go to a bigger atom, this sloshing is even more and you get stronger London dispersion forces, stronger intermolecular forces. So when you think molar refraction, which has the symbol R sub M, and we're gonna see it a lot now, um, think London dispersion forces, which is already a topic that our Gen Chem students know about. Okay. And then I wanna present the equation for molar refraction, it's right here. And the equation for molar refraction has N, the refractive index, and molar volume, which we've already talked about. And what we're gonna do, oh, and this equation is called uh, the Lorentz, Lorenz equation based on two scientists from the late 1800s who derived the relationship independent of each other. Um, but what we're gonna do is we're going to measure refractive indices. Those are the N values. We're going to have values for molar refraction and convert them into uh, sort of turn this equation on its head. We have a couple more things to say about this. Ah, so here's the water value for molar refraction and for ethanol. And the larger molar refraction uh, value is indicative of the fact that uh, there's more London dispersion forces. There's more polarizability. There's more electrons sloshing around uh, the nuclei, the more, more nuclei. All right, well, it turns out we're gonna take a little detour here because molar refraction, R sub M, is an additive property based on atomic refractions. So if you take a single bonded carbon, hydrogens and oxygens, they each have these values for atomic refractivity and you can basically add them up to get an estimate of the molar, uh, sorry, the molar refraction of the uh, water molecule. And you can see the value here for the calculated versus the experiment is not 100% accurate, but it's pretty close. And then we can do the same thing for ethanol here. And again, not perfect, but surprisingly accurate. Um, and so what we're going to say is we're going to use our molar refraction values to relate our index of refractions, which we measure, to our molar volumes. So that's where we're going with this. Lots of calculations involved. One more thing I want to say about molar refraction, which is that for me, once I started delving into this, I sort of felt like I was having the new car effect. New car effect, when you get a new car or a new car to you, you start seeing those cars on the road all over the place. Now that I'm reading and know what molar refraction is, I'm starting to find it in all sorts of places. And one of the places I saw was that molar refraction is used in the drug design business to determine drug likeness which is a strange term, but the idea is if you wanna make a pharmaceutical drug, there are certain uh, values that it must have. And so one through four up here, not more than five hydrogen bond donors, for example, an alcohol group, all these things up here, but sure enough, molar refraction, there is a desired molar refraction if you're going to make a new pharmaceutical. And so drug likeness is a concept that uses molar refraction 
to design new pharmaceuticals, at least as one of the criteria, which is pretty awesome, I think. Totally separate topic than we're even talking about, but mole refraction relates. All right, so um, it turns out that molar refraction is a nearly linear function of solution composition, even for non-ideal solutions. And again, so what we've got our original equation for molar refraction, we're gonna rearrange to solve for molar volume right here. And basically once we measure the refractive indices, we will use molar refractions to get our molar volumes. That's where we're going with this. Um, and so in the next slides, I'm gonna start with the measure of the refractive indices of the solutions. That's the data that we take. And we're gonna go through a series of steps to get to the, the partial molar volume. So this is all calculations and let's see how we do. So here's the data that we said that we collected before Autumn's data. And remember, it's non-ideal because there's a difference between the green dots, which are our measured values, and the ideal or linear relationship between pure water down here, which is zero to propanol, and pure to propanol up here. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to plot this difference between these two on the next slide and call that the excess refractive index or the excess refractive indices. So this is the difference between those green dots and the straight line from the previous picture. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take these values. We're gonna assume that molar refraction is ideal. And then we're gonna get what's called excess molar volume. And now we can see that the excess molar volume, and that should be on the next one too, is here's excess molar volume, and that the excess molar volume is smaller than ideal, meaning that um, the molecules are closer together. So the next thing is we're going to fit this excess molar volume to what's called a redlish Kister polynomial. And the reason we've chosen this is because uh, if we look at the way this breaks down, so our data will always be zero at mole fraction equals zero, and that's what this first term is, where x1 is the mole fraction of 2 propanol. Our data will always be zero at one because those are just the pure components. There will be no differences there. And then, oh, so it will always be zero at x1 equals one. And the rest of it more or less looks like a parabola shape. So a parabola has three constants, C1, C2, and C3, with a squared power, a first power, and uh, a zeroth power, or just a constant. So we've chosen this to fit it to. When we fit it, we get values for C1, C2, and C3, and our data fits very nicely, actually. And I should say, again, the relish kister polynomial fit is not something that we're coming up with new. Previous people have done that, and um, we're just doing it as well. Um, so, so much of science is based on what's been previously done. And what's nice is we're going to fit our data. We're going to turn that into partial molar volume versus mole fraction. And I've got that for the two propanol in the green and water in the yellow. And the green and yellow dots are our calculated and experimental values. And the green and yellow dashed lines are literature values. So we're always comparing ourselves to what we do in the literature to see if what we're doing is correct. And uh, let me talk about this graph because this is the, the finished product for each of our sets of data here. So if I look at the green lines, uh, or sorry, the green dots. So here, this one on the, where mole fraction of two propanol is one, that's just pure two propanol. So that's the molar volume of two, two propanol. And as we put more and more water, 
the molar volume or the partial molar volume of the 2-propanol decreases. And this is in effect that the 2-propanol is hiding amongst more and more water molecules. And for the water, the same thing. Here's pure water. As we add more 2-propanol, we are seeing that the water, the partial molar volume decreases. And the partial molar volume decreases because the water molecules are hiding in amongst the 2-propanol. Um, and what I would say is um, the comparing it to the literature values, we are qualitatively able to predict. So we see decreases, but our values are off. So, um, and uh, that's based on the fact that we're measuring refractive indices. We're assuming that the molar refraction is ideal. And that's not perfect, but it's a good approximation. And we're turning them into partial molar volumes. So my analysis of this is, we're doing good work, we're qualitatively predicting the trends, but we're not 100% accurate. Always good to be critical of your own data. But what's great about this is we can then do data for other systems. And these are other systems that nobody has ever done before. So this is, there's no literature values. And we chose N-heptane-1-octanol, and heptane um, is a um, organic molecule with um, uh, sort of, sorry, non-polar, that's the word I'm looking for. While one octanol is a polar molecule, we can repeat the process. And you can see that our data shows again, negative excess molar volumes. And we can turn those into our, um, partial molar volumes. And we see some interesting things here. We see some um, very, very much some, some interesting things. And there's no data out there. So I can't compare it to the literature values. There's no literature. Um, but what we can do and what our future work will do is we'll actually go and try and improve our estimates of measuring the partial molar volumes. And this gives us a good idea of where to look. And we've also looked at uh, a binary system, including bicyclohexyl and hexadecane. And we've chosen this one because bicyclohexyl has a ringed structure in it. And hexadecane is a straight chain hydrocarbon. And there's been some evidence in the literature that rings versus straight molecules lead to positive excess molar volumes and we can measure this. So this is different than the previous ones. Remember the previous ones, we had excess molar volume negative, excess molar volume negative, and now we've got excess molar volume positive. So we are uh, hoping to be able to predict and then measure both negative and positive partial molar volumes using this work. And we've had good success. And uh, we have a lot more work to do. This project started in the fall. And uh, I'd say we've made good progress. Um, or sorry, this project started last spring, in fact, at home. Uh, what we've been doing is meeting on Fridays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And during that time, while meeting in person, we've actually been able to use um, the hoods and use significantly more volatile compounds uh, than we ever did at home. And I would say uh, this is very promising uh, results. Oh, and again, so let me show this partial molar volume. So uh, as we go from pure bicyclohexyl down here at one, it, uh, it actually takes more volume now. So instead of hiding amongst the different, the other for, part of the solution, these molecules are now spreading the other molecules out to take up more space. And again, why are the partial molar volumes larger or smaller? Nobody knows the exact answer, but we can start to think about this and uh, make predictions about different molecules and uh, watch them come true. And again, bicyclohexyl hexadecane is a system 
where um, uh, no, there are no literature values. And I should mention, uh, I believe the N-heptane octanol system, uh, I believe that's Laura's data and bicyclohexyl hexadecane, um, I believe that's Anthony's data, although I'll have to check to make sure. So everybody's contributing, everybody's working hard to get their data. In conclusion, we have estimated the partial molar volumes of each component in a binary solution using refractive index data that we have collected. Our estimates rely on assuming that the molar refraction acts ideally, even for non-ideal solutions. And that's not a perfect assumption, I can tell you. And that's reflected in the fact that our estimates are not perfect. Um, though I would say in number three, our estimates are qualitatively correct, but generally underestimate the non-ideal solution behavior from the literature values. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the support of Prince George's Community College uh, for support of this work and uh, our list of current group members, um, all at PGCC and uh, previous group members on this project, uh, Kellen, Barbriana, Sophia, and Chloe. And uh, it's been, uh, they've done some amazing work and I'm really happy with where we're going with this. That's the end of my talk. I'd be happy to take any questions you've got. Um, you can either post them into the chat, and I'm sorry, I haven't seen if there's been any questions in the chat already, but please feel free to post questions in the chat um, or just to speak up, uh, raise your hand or whatever you'd like. Um, and again, thank you for your attention. Now go back to some of our data actually. Oop. Hmm. Yes, I'm very happy to share. Uh, Glad to hear. Yes, the, the student researchers have done some really uh, amazing work. Um, and again, so the idea behind this work is, so what have our students learned? Not only have they learned about the science, they've done a lot of Excel work, they've uh, kept notebooks, they've um, used, so we've got a safety protocol in our lab, they have to get safety training to work on this project. Um, and uh, the topic, um, yeah. uh, oh, um, sorry, I see, was there a question? Okay, uh, so, uh, and the topic touch, so uh, we can have students who are, I have uh, Kate who is in, uh, who I showed her data at the beginning. Kate is in Chem 1010 right now. And uh, all of the other students are, have, uh, oh, Anthony's in Chem 2000. Um, Laura's, Laura, uh, so Autumn is in Chem 2000. Laura is a previous Chem 1010 student. Um, let's see. Uh, Tondurai is actually a high school student um, that I was connected with. Um, yep, and Kellen, uh, I met and has worked on previous projects. Aubriana is a Chem 1010 student. Uh, Sophia is a PGCC student that I was connected with. And Chloe is a student from uh, Sacramento City College where I used to teach. So just amazing. So, so Dr. Miller, I have a question. So the students that are in your class, how do you get them involved in the research? Do they come to you and ask, uh, I wanna do some research or do you just put out what you're doing and then they, just follow suit with you and say, hey, I want to be a, I want to participate with that. How, how, what does that process look like for students to get involved? Yeah, uh, good question, um, Galvin. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I do talk about research in my class. Um, I've uh, in the past I've done presentations either during, uh, including during STEM week, but I also just did a presentation way back at the very beginning when I first got here, uh, almost two years ago at this point, and. Um, and publicized it amongst the chemistry uh, 
uh, faculty, students, and uh, Tracy's actually, uh, and the STEM Collegian Center has been really helpful because uh, I think uh, Autumn and Kellen uh, were both students that came to my presentations or, or came through the STEM Collegian Center. So, uh, but I do, I, I talk to students. I, um, I reached out, I think, um, correct, me, correct me if I'm wrong, Laura, but I think I reached out to Laura because Laura was just a very active student in class. Um, and I said, hey, would you be interested in doing research? And I'm fortunate, I was fortunate that she was. Uh, Kate, I know at the beginning of this semester, I had some openings. And so I published, uh, I sent an announcement in my classes and said, hey, I've got some openings. If you're interested, let me know. Actually, Kate and Anthony both contacted me and uh, got into the lab. So it's, it's, you know, one of the nice things about doing research about Gen Chem topics is that um, I, can, I can bring the research right into the class. I can say, hey, I'm doing research on, that's related to uh, London dispersion forces. I'm doing research on basically how we make solutions and how we make solutions we talk about in like the third week of class. So yeah, um, always you know, looking for good students, talking to students about the research. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and um, if I can just say something, I just want to say thank you because during the pandemic, you know, I think a lot of students are trying to find something to do, something extra to do. And yeah, you just made it available to the class and just like offered it up. So I appreciate that. Oh, sure, Chloe. Yeah, no, and Chloe also did research last spring during the pandemic at home. And I should say, um, at home, so the basis of this work we used uh, the kits that we're using, the at-home lab kits, and, um, and uh, the students had basically water and they had to purchase, um, I think we used 91% um, isopropanol alcohol, which is two propanol is isopropyl alcohol. And so the beginning of this research was it can be done at home because it uses over-the-counter materials. So, uh, and we did not use uh, bicyclohexyl or um, hexane or heptane until we got into the lab itself and could use hoods. But um, anyway, yes, so uh, very, um, and, and, you know, if I can say just one other thing, I think that being able to do, you do the at-home lab kits for chem, the chem, general chemistry courses, um, really helped me to think about how to do research as well. So there's really a synergy there. And the overall goal is for me, and, and this is another subject of my research, is can we and how can we do very well online chemistry courses that include labs? And sort of my next topic or one of my active areas of research uh, that I started working on this semester is uh, how do we incorporate course-based undergraduate research into Chem 1010 and into Chem 2000? Because getting students uh, doing research face-to-face, -face, but also at home, it's a proven uh, technique for keeping them involved in STEM uh, courses and majors, getting them interested. So um, anyway. As always, uh, uh, ask a simple question. I tell you how, how to build a clock instead of a time again. But any other questions? Uh, Anthony, I see your question on slide 17. Get back there. Okay. Um, does the, so uh, it says, I have a question for slide 17. In the molar free energy graph, does that graph for a given solution have the same shape regardless of the temperature? Good question. Um, and uh, Anthony, you're in my Gen, uh, you're my Chem 2000, which is sort of Gen Chem 1 and Gen Chem 2 in one semester. So you've got, uh, uh, but no. So um, one of the things that happens 
uh, with uh, partial molar free energies is that the free energy is a function of temperature, pressure uh, for gases, um, uh, volume, molar, uh, partial molar volumes, um, and each of the mole fractions of the components. And so we don't do it in Gen Chem 2 or in Chem 2000, but when you move on to um, a course called physical chemistry, which chemists and chemical engineers end up taking, um, you actually start, right? You, you have to take the partial derivatives with respect to three or four different variables. And, but, but to answer your question, uh, no, it's not regardless of temperature. So temperature would be constant um, for uh, this kind of plot. And so it would have a different slope. It would have a different uh, shape. It would still have a minimum at some point, um, but uh, it could look totally different. Good question. Any other questions? Um, yes, I uh, have a question, Professor. Um, so um, were these uh, experiments done from the students who previously uh, enrolled in your course and took it from previous semesters? Um, was this from the um, finding the refractive index and breaks of other food substances, just like you've been teaching us at Chem 1010? Yes, Kevin. Uh, you're, so uh, you guys uh, were sort of my guinea pigs this semester because you were the first ones to do to use the, hand, the handheld refractometers in Chem 1010 class. Um, so, but think of it this way. Um, two or three semesters ago, when I developed the kits, I, I, I keep adding little things to them. And this semester, I added the handheld refractometers. And Kevin, um, you all had a different project where you had to just measure a uh, substance that had never been measured before, like baking soda or something like that. I'm not sure which substance you did. Um, oh, oh, I used um, baking soda and um, uh, which, which is the other one? Oh yeah, NACL, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, NACL was the one where I gave you the data for so you could compare. Mm -hmm. And then baking soda, sodium uh, bicarbonate was the, the research part of it because we didn't have correct values for it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but so one of the things that I like to do and uh, you know, I uh, <laughs> you, uh, sometimes even over a margarita on the weekends, I like to think about how our students can do new things using the simple techniques we teach in Chem 1010 and general chemistry. And so um, I didn't think that Chem 1010 was necessarily ready for this project, mm -hmm. but, I, but I knew you were ready for something. And now my Chem 1010 students are perfectly situated to join my research group because you've already used the handheld refractometer, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. And so actually that brings up a good point, Kevin. I'm gonna post, I'm just posting this in the chat right now. So uh, that is a link to a Google form. And okay. um, so it, it's unfortunately, uh, right, as far as, well, let's say my plans are that my group is full for the spring. But the form asks if you're interested, if you're gonna be at PGCC next year and you want to join my research group, um, fill out that form and just let me know you're interested. And I will reach out to you to see if you're still interested uh, for fall 22. Unfortunately, my group right now is about as big as it's, it can get with me managing things, but... Um, Anyway, so uh, if you're interested, Kevin, I'd love to have you fill out the form and we'll just keep in touch. But uh, I'd like to, if possible, grow not only my group uh, with new projects and continuing these projects, but also if we have enough fac uh, students who are interested, then we can reach out to other faculty and see if they'd like um, to do research projects as well. And, um, uh 
Uh, it's, it has piqued my interest. So um, what projects uh, do we com uh, conduct and complete specifically? Uh, is it similar to the projects that we have been doing here in CAM 1010 that you've been showing us um, with lab kits or? Well, so good question, Kevin. Um, so one of the things you'll learn, uh, and this is what I learned when doing research in undergrad and grad school, is that, um, so, so I don't, you know, I'm thinking of projects, but I never know which project is gonna come to be the project for the next semester. Um, mm. So what, what, you know, some people, when they go to graduate school, they know what they wanna work on, right? I was not like that. I just knew I wanted, when I was an undergrad, I knew I wanted to do undergraduate research. And I knew that I wanted, and when I went to grad school, same thing, but you know, I didn't pick a project. Like I didn't know what I wanted to work on. I just knew I wanted to work. And so I ask that my students do the same thing, which is know that you're gonna be learning new things, know that you're gonna be developing research skills that are so, um, useful when you transfer or when you're out in the workforce. But I, I, I don't exactly know what the projects will be because I don't know where this project's gonna be after this year, but so I don't have a good answer for you. I can tell you that one of my projects that I'd like to get going next year is that, okay, this research, I told you um, we actually, um, let's see. I don't know if I can find it here. Oh. Uh, so we actually estimate the partial molar volumes um, using the refractive indices. Well, I think that next year, what we'd like to do after we finish this project or make more progress is that I think we can measure the partial molar volumes directly. And I don't think it's that hard and I don't think it's been done before, certainly not in a gen chem lab or a community college. So one mm -hmm. of my ideas is instead of, instead of using the handheld refractometers um, to actually measure the partial molar volumes directly. And that's a whole nother conversation, but that's a possible project. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it will work. We'll see though. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, but definitely sign up if you're interested and then uh, keep. So Fridays 10 to two is typically when I like to do my research. So I'll plan on doing that again in the fall. Um, and yeah, so uh, we'll see. Okay. Thank, thank you. That, that has piqued my interest actually. Excellent. Since I'm a science student. Uh, awesome. We have time for one or two more questions. Uh, Nalanti, when you read research articles, you keep changing your mind, yes. Yeah, no, so um, it's, it's, it's very interesting. And Nalanti and I have talked about uh, the fact that Nalanti uh, wants to get involved in research at some point. Um, uh, and you know what, what I love, and I guess I should say, so my research, so there's two types of research really, like there's, there's the research that develops new science. And, uh, and, and I guess mine's in there, but mine is more about developing new chemistry education materials, okay? So new labs, new ways of teaching, which is research, but it's not like I'm going to ever win the Nobel prize for what I'm doing. I'm not coming up with, if you've heard of CRISPR technologies to edit DNA, that's cutting edge stuff. My projects, they're simple, they're publishable, and they're publishable in education journals, not in Science Magazine or Nature. Uh, Laura, um, oh, so um, to answer your question, Laura, asking about research in the spring. So my group, everybody who's there is invited to continue in the spring if you have the time. And so my plan, that's why my research group is full. It's full with my students now. Um, I guess, uh, Kevin, to answer, to address your question a little bit more, if my students uh, transfer or take other classes, right? Because you, you do research only after all your other classes are going okay. And I'm very clear about this. 
right? Research is a bonus. Love to have students doing it, but, um, but I understand that classes, getting, your trans, getting transferred to your next place and getting the grades that you need to do it, those are all super important. And if you have time for research, then you do it. And so all my students, I'm planning on them continuing in the spring and continuing to do more solutions. Um, and uh, hopefully actually, uh, you know, I'm planning on having all those students who I showed at the beginning do um, posters at the Maryland Collegiate STEM um, conference in the spring as well. We'll take a field trip out there. Um, but yes, so all, so I like to sign students up for the year. There's no, like I like to commit to them for a year. If they can't commit to me, I totally understand. Grades come first, family comes first. Um, but then if you have time, we do some research. Um, Stefan, yes. Hmm. Well, thank you. Um, and Stefan, uh, you are definitely a student that if you would like to join my group, uh, I, I've noticed your work and your hard work. I should say, I'm not looking for students who are necessarily all A students. I'm looking for hardworking students. And I've made offers to A students to be in my group. I've made offers to C students to be in my group and you know, B, A, B, C, anywhere in there. It's the hardworking aspect. And you know what can you do with this research afterwards? These are resume items. These are uh, recommendation letter items. So if you're in my group and you transfer to Maryland, say, and you need a letter that's, uh, because you wanna do research at Maryland, right? That's the next step then you can, um, then I will write you a letter. And uh, eventually I'd like to build relationships and just sort of funnel students into groups at Maryland or you know, build, uh, at Bowie State, at UMBC, Towson, wherever you're going. So, um, and I've had, I've had students who three or four years later, they're finally ready to do research. And, um, and so they ask me for a letter of recommendation to do research. So, uh, or a job. I mean, that's, that's part of the, the job that I do too. And I'm more than happy to do it is write letters of recommendation. I mean, that's, that's why I got into this research actually is because I saw that our students at community college were just as good, if not better than a lot of the students at University of Maryland, uh, Bowie, wherever, but they couldn't do research and they were often missing opportunities to do research because by the time they transferred and by the time they got their feet wet and were ready, they were ready to graduate. And so anyway, this is it's all part of, it's all part of the Rube Goldberg machine that's going in our faculty's uh, minds here as we think about how to serve our students. Um, Safan, keep in touch, uh, fill out that Google form uh, that I just submitted uh, because I'll definitely be getting in touch with those people. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to accommodate as many students as possible. Um, well, I know we're just, so it's, I wanted to keep this at about an hour. We're just about there. Uh, I think I'll just wrap up now and you can always email me. And if anybody doesn't have my email address, I'm typing it into the chat right now. Email me if you have, oh. <laughs> Uh, let me email everyone. There's my email. Um, again, thank you for coming. If you have any other questions, please feel free to get in touch. And thanks again. And I'll stick around for a couple more minutes if anybody has any questions. Make it a great day, everybody.